This week, Iron Maiden. <laughs> Iron Maiden is on KISS. It's on a KISS podcast. This is really cool stuff. Dennis Stratton talks about Maiden and touring with KISS this week. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. Oh, it is three sides this week. Last week, we were two sides of the coin. Hey, we've got Doctor Who joining us this week. <laughs> Doctor Who, Tommy Sumter, Ed. <laughs> what what names do we call him? And after A-hole. the ending we just got done with, I'm like, God, I should have taken another week <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, look, you wouldn't have been missed. I- hey, who, who, doesn't like, who doesn't like a good Pujo? Come on. Uh, <laughs> um, so we've got a, a, a great guest that we had been working on for a number of weeks here, going back and forth and rescheduling and everything else. And um, this is going to be some amazing stories. Before we get to um, this week's guest, um, just a reminder, forget the haters, we won. <laughs> Jesus. How can everyone not understand? Honestly, okay, people. One more time. We're going to explain what forget the haters we won means. Please do. So are you sitting down, paying attention, listen, turn off the music, stop driving, whatever you're doing. This will take just a minute. It's not difficult. Forget the haters we won was basically a phrase coined by Mark, I don't know, uh, over a year ago, maybe. Well over a year, yeah, longer than that. And basically what it means is we refers to the band and their fans. Mm-hmm. Collectively, Not three sides. Collectively, we. The Everyone. Kiss Army and the band. We won, forget the haters, meaning you remember growing up as a kid, and I don't care whether you're 15 years old or 55 years old, somebody somewhere along the line said, Kiss sucks. They can't play. They're terrible. They're never going to last. Nobody's going to remember them. Just a phase. Just they a don't phase. play their own instruments. It's just makeup. Mm-hmm. Whatever the excuse goes on and on and on. We've all heard it. Fans mm-hmm. and the band have heard this for nearly 50 years. So what forget the haters we won means is, yeah, all you guys who put down our band, we won because our band is still here in 2021, touring, playing live, and not just to a bar filled with 100 people. Arenas, stadiums around the world, the demand is still there. So we won. Our band is still standing. Our band is crossing the finish line the way they want to cross the finish line. So forget all those haters out there who said they would never last. We won. They made it. There you go. It has nothing to do with three sides of the coin. Zero. It's purely us as a KISS fan being damn proud that our band stood the test of time and is still here. All right. As I, I've said this, I think I may have said it a couple weeks ago. Go back to 1982. Tell everyone at the lunch table that in 2021, KISS will have their own crews. They'll be playing a fell farewell tour with arenas and stadiums around the world. And Journey and Pat Benatar and Styx may be doing a package tour at Pine Knob and Amphitheater. That's all. Right. That's, 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 we were like, no, we love Kiss. <laughs> they're they're going to last. We, 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 as in the Kiss Army, knew there was something more to Kiss. Correct. As in the Kiss Army, not me, not an individual. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, so, 
for all of you who have a very difficult time understanding what Forget the Haters We Won means, I hope we made it very simple and clear for you. And if you're going to be accused of changing the meaning. Yeah. And if not, who cares? <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's the stupidest. I, again, I'm not going to get into it. Why anyone would even pay heed to any of the stupid shit we say is fucking beyond me. So. I know. I mean, listen, from episode one, three sides of the coin has never been objective. And we've admitted that all along. We are completely subjective. It's our opinions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. It's our opinions. Doesn't mean they're right or wrong. It's just our opinion. But we aren't objective about this. Let's be clear. Mm-hmm. So there you go. That's just stirring the pot again, I guess. Oh, yep. by the way, anybody looking for a Christmas gifts, gift this December? I bet it won't be a book. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, the latest update. Yes, magic will be here for Christmas. This is July 27th. Let, let me just remind everybody that in June of 2015, it was also promised for Christmas of 2015. It ain't happening, people. But we'll keep you updated. By the way, just so I'm on record, I'm not saying it's not happening. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I did say it wasn't going to come out by Christmas of 2015. So that part I'm confident with. That's only thing I ever said. Next thing you know, like, we're going to show those three sides guys how fucking stupid they are. It's, look, dude, I just said I wasn't going to come out. In June, I said I wasn't going to be out by Christmas of 2015. I already won. I already won that argument. That's it. It comes out now, this Christmas, next Christmas. I hope to God everybody gets what they paid for. I have no skin in the game. I don't care. Yeah. You I know just, what? You know what, Mark? Forget those haters. We did win. <laughs> well, that's exactly a great point. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I already uh, won that argument. I don't need to. I don't need to. Keep oh, to God. Anymore. But it's just funny when, because I even get emails about it. And I am some, you see, they're, they're talking about three sides saying Ross is sure going to show those guys. I'm like, A, I don't have a problem with Ross. B, I didn't invest in the book for the same reasons I told you guys not to fucking invest in the book. He's not going to have it ready for Christmas of 2015. I, I, will, I, will, I will say this. For the sake of all the people who have money with him, I hope he does show us up and get it Amen. done. So these people who gave him money will actually get something out of it and not get screwed. I'm a supporter of that. I just think it's been run like, put it this way. I have no beef with the guy. But you can't, nobody can be objective and say, yeah, he's done a good job. No, he hasn't. He's done a horrible job. Yeah. That's all. Yep. So, all right. So there you go. So uh, hey let's oh. get, let's get to this week's <laughs> interview. Hey, oh, Dr. Who's talking to the Daleks right now. Um, that's going way over heads. Um, this week, we're going all the way back to 1980, Europe, KISS. And Iron Maiden. And why are we doing this? Because we've got somebody from Iron Maiden who was on that album and on that tour. Doctor Who just left. Um, somebody from Iron Maiden who was on that album and on that tour joining us this week to talk about those early days of Maiden, talk about touring with Kiss, stories of uh, the road. And answering geeky drum questions. Geeky drum questions. <laughs> I wonder who asked those. <laughs> who, who says, I never knew that answer. I, that is correct. So you're, even you geeky maiden heads, is you're that a term? Something. Yep, you're it is learn, now. You're going to learn something in this episode. I didn't know it, and I've never read that before. We are joined by the one and only Dennis Stratton. This is awesome. Believe me. It was so worth it. We had to change our schedules to accommodate getting Dennis on because he's he was in the studio in you in the UK. And what a great guy, wasn't he? God, yep. 
I love when we finish interviews and I'm like, fuck, I could talk to that guy for another hour, man. That was fucking awesome. So many cool stories. So mm -hmm. many great stories. So he, he even tells us the, the birthday present that Gene and Paul gave him. And where? And where when he was taken out for his birthday in 1980. Um, all right. So let it roll. Dennis Stratton. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker T? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Hey, Three Sides fans. Quite the honor today. Um, the legendary Dennis Stratton. Um, from well let's go back because uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today from iron maiden right uh, from the first release so uh dennis welcome to the show hi good to see you thank you very much it, it, it is a real pleasure and a true honor dennis thank you so much and 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 just so all of our mm -hmm. listeners know we we are recording you're in the uk so it's like 5 30 p.m your time something like yeah. that yeah I, it's 9.30 my time in California in the morning. We, this was so important to us that we totally changed our recording schedule to accommodate uh, getting Dennis on. Very kind. Thank you very and, much. Uh, I know it's going to be great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's just that uh, yeah. I, I, I live on a farm and um, I don't have the internet. And so um, basically I, I come to this is Fairy Crop Studios where... I do a lot of my recording and um, a lot of the stuff we do for Lionheart. So um, it's all digital it's, and we've got this. So the guys here that run the studio let me come here like it's my second home. So it's great. Well, let's let's just to to appease the the Kiss fans first and foremost, so they don't yell at us about you guys didn't talk about Kiss at all. <laughs> let's 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 go back and and. Uh, you know, for KISS fans who may not know a lot of KISS history, which that's fine, um, Iron Maiden supported KISS when KISS went to Europe in 1980. 80. Yeah, it was in support of Unmasked. The first record. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. KISS was there supporting Unmasked, um, and Maiden was supporting their debut album. So, um, you know... Obviously, Dennis, looking back now, fans could sit here and go, wow, that's kind of odd. Iron Maiden opening and supporting Kiss when Kiss was doing their pop, their disco, their, you know, when, when Kiss was the least metal they've ever been, I guess you could say. But take us back to, as Mark loves to say, timeline is everything. Take us back in that timeline, Dennis to when you heard you guys were going to be supporting kiss what what did as a band what were you guys thinking were you like holy crap this is incredible well to be honest um we had we had um we'd already been just been on the judas priest tour um, um because you gotta remember it was the first year of uh, the actual new lineup um, venturing out on, in, into live shows. Um, we'd already done the Metal for Mothers tour with Pro Mantis, and um, the album was out and it charted. Um, so once we'd done the Judas Priest tour, it was it was great news to find out that um, we were going to do this European uh, tour with Kiss and Scandinavia. Um, we didn't realise at the time that we weren't going to be doing the London dates or the UK dates. Uh, we found out afterwards the reason why, because um, I think in the UK, Maiden had a few more fans than Kiss did uh, in 1980, because uh, I think the, the, the rumour went around that Kiss had gone off the boil a little bit, and um, it was one of those um, times where you get a young band coming up who's exciting, and uh, when you support um, someone like that, uh, it's... Yeah, it, it's like, um, you know, you've got to grab, grab your chance. So um, when we'd come off the Judas Priest tour, we were, we were ready to go. But then uh, we got out there and I got on absolutely brilliantly with, um, with um, 
uh, Gene Simmons and uh, Paul Stanley, um, really good friends. And um, yeah, what, what I found really exciting was the fact that when we got to these venues, because these were going to be the biggest venues we played, because uh, in the UK we were playing with Priest, they were like the Hammersmith Odeon or the, or the Rainbow or something like that, so 3,000 people. So when you got out into Italy and things like that, in Germany, in you know, on that tour, um, they were big arenas, big places, and uh, we were very excited. But the biggest buzz we got was that when our tour bus was driving into the venue, uh, we noticed that um, sitting outside the venue where most fans sit for the afternoon, especially if it's sunshine, they're outside waiting for, waiting for the doors to open that there was a huge amount of fans wearing Iron Maiden T-shirts. And that gave us a really big, a really big buzz. And uh, yeah, so that, that's the first impressions I got was, um, you know, the stadiums didn't worry me because my previous band, RDB, went to the status quo in the mid seventies. And we went all over Europe and Scandinavia and we played a lot of football stadiums and a lot of ice hockey stadiums. And, so I was used to the big stage. I was used to the big show. Um, but this was Maiden's first uh, big arena tour with Kiss. And as I say, they they were there for the taking. And I think we did a really good job by, by you know, we, we gained a lot of fans on that tour. Do you, were you, were the other guys in Maiden Kiss fans before this? Uh, not really, I wasn't. Um, I can't answer for the rest of the band. Um, um, oh, I don't know. I used to see them, you know, in, in the, the comics that they had and, they, you know, the, the uh, comic uh, characters. But, um, no, I, I wasn't a lover of the makeup and all that. I, I was more of the hard rock. Um, mostly, a lot of my favourite bands are American anyway, as people know, like uh, with Journey and Foreigner and Toto and things like that in Kansas, but in the UK, you know, with white snake, deep purple, black Sabbath, it was a bit different to see all the, all the makeup and the costumes and that. So, yeah, it was, it was interesting, especially you, back today, you know. Yeah, were you interested or did you see any of the Kiss shows from 76 uh, when they played in the UK or were, was that even on your radar? No, I was too busy. I, in the, from 76, 75, 76 to 79, I was too busy with the band I was working with, which was RDB. So um, we were we, had, we were signed to the same management as State as well, and Rory Gallagher. So we were working quite a lot. And I find that when you're working with your own band and touring, you, you tend to not get out so much with um, for shows and, and seeing other bands. So no, I didn't. Now, were, were you guys in Maiden aware that the Kiss sound had drastically changed by 80? That, that, you know, you weren't touring with the Kiss from Kiss Alive, the debut album. It wasn't the raw metal aggressive version, but it was, again, it was pop. It was disco. It was, it was a different version. Um, yeah. Were, were you aware of that sound change and were you sitting here going, boy, this is an interesting match. We're a metal band and we're going out and even though Kiss is huge, we're opening for a band that's now basically gone pop rock. Um, well, to be honest, like, like, as I said, just said, um, I didn't hear any of their early stuff. I wasn't a fan really and I didn't hear um, much of their album. So when we went on tour with them, this was a new... Uh, a new opening for me to listen to them. And, you know, it wasn't until Dave Lights was telling me about, he told me a little bit about the history of the band. But I imagine um, Steve, Steve Harris, or maybe Steve or Dave would have, would have known about the early days of Kiss, because they, probably, they may have been a fan, but I, as I say, I can't answer that because I don't know if they were fans or not. But for me, this was all new. It came along and I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a, a, a sort of listening fan from uh, during the, the late seventies because I was too busy working doing other stuff. So, so because it was new to you, 
Um, I'm sure you 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 watched some of their shows and you you heard some of the music because you guys were on oh, tour yeah, together. Yeah. What what was your impression then once you heard the songs and saw the show? Yeah, I, I watched them every night. Um, I was backstage when they went on stage, um, with, you know, you know, giving them good luck and, and a great gig and all that. And then I'd go out the front and yes, I I, I thought it was great. Every show I thought it was great. Uh, Paul Stanley we had a, was singing so well on that tour, and um, he's got a great range. Um, but uh, yeah, the theatrical stuff with Gene flying around, and you know, that, I, I thought it was always a great show, and I've probably watched nearly every, every show from that tour. Hey, I gotta, I gotta, because this kind of ties in with Kiss a little bit. Um, after. Um, after the founding me members, Peter and Ace left, you know, they eventually sold their rights and stuff. And I know you didn't get a much of an opportunity to write in Maiden. I think the only songwriting credit you didn't the whole band get something for Sanctuary. And I was just wondering if, if you, if, if you retained your songwriting credit, is that the only song that you are credited officially credited uh, with is Sanctuary? Because I think that's a band. No, I, don't, I don't think so. No, um, all the songs were written before I joined. So, okay. uh, so that was yeah. you didn't even get a piece of that then. No, I wouldn't have thought so. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. Um, no, because when I when I joined them, um, basically they were just three members: Deano, Dave Murray, and uh, Steve. They, they were a free piece with no drummer and, and no just you know one singer. Uh, Dave just playing guitar. He doesn't sing, so uh, the reason they got me in was because they'd been watching me play where we lived in East London, back, stay, uh, back at the Bridge House, and um, they knew I could do, you know, the, the guitar stuff, and they knew I could sing, so they got me in, But uh, and then I took Clive into the band, but um, no, when I first met them, um, they gave me a Soundhouse tape cassette, and um, all I could hear was this really badly recorded uh, punky sort of sound, which was very powerful. Um, and I think that had all the stuff from Sanctuary on it. So all them songs were written, I think, by Steve um, well before I, I joined the band. Who's, whose idea was it to do I've Got the Fire? Because that is an incredible cover, um, uh, the old Montrose tune. Like, how did I've that... No idea. I've no idea because I never played that with a band, I don't think. Well, I might have done it live. I, I thought that was right on the I see that's why I'm, I'm so happy to talk to you. I thought that was right on the cusp of of when because of that. So that's slightly after you then, right? No, that was that was probably one of the early ones because what you have to remember is is um they had so many songs from, from working the circuit in the UK and they built up a big fan base. So what you have to remember is if they go out and headline a gig. You know, I'm talking about now the album's out. So you've got you've got three jobs to do. You've got um, we're, we're on the Metal for Mothers tour in 1979, uh, and then we need an hour and a half set to uh, to do a full show. So all the songs that came out from the tapes that Steve had, we did an hour and a half show because we're headlining. And then when we supported Kiss. We then go back to a 45-minute set, which then Steve whittled, whittled down the the uh, set. Was that me? I'm not getting a call. Is that, is that you? Sorry, I think that's the phone here. Sorry. That's okay. Um, it's all good. And so um, basically, you then cut the set down to 45 minutes because you're supporting Judas Priest. So then Steve would whittle the set down to the best, the most interesting 45 minutes of songs. Then we had to whittle it down even more to record the album. So you're, you're boxing around with different shows, different sets. And then once we'd done the Judas Priest tour, we already had the 45, 50 minute set rehearsed and ready to go to, go to see Kiss. Um, but it, it was hard because I came into the band um, before, just as they signed a deal with EMI. So basically, you've got, what you've got to remember is, is um, I'm given a job to do, to, to put these songs together. And also I, I work with Harmony Guitars, which they've never had. 
So my all my bands I've worked with have harmony guitars, tune guitars. Maiden have never had that. And I'm thankfully, I'm glad that they still carry it on now. But when I went into the band, it was just raw. It was a punk sound. It had one guitar. Maybe Dave may have tracked the guitar. Mostly rhythms. He does the solos. And um, so that was it. And so what you got to remember is when I start working on the songs with Phantom running free, um, everything, I wanted to put the harmony guitars into the songs, which was more work. And that's, that's how we started building the sound for the new lineup. Because, you know, as I say, the old lineup with the people that were in the band when they were like a pub band or a club band, that didn't bother me. It was the job to do to, to bring the songs out, being more interesting with more interest, with more space, with a wider sound. By doing that, you use two guitars and you split the sounds and then I add the vocal. So it made the lineup a completely same band, but just slightly different uh, with a wider, a, a bigger sound. And um, that, that's basically how how the sound come about. I'm going to take this phone off the hook because I'm only <laughs> uh, a couple a couple other geeky you know early questions. So you were there for Burning Ambition then? I'm, I, I'm just looking for the yeah that, that would have been part of the live set. I can't remember it, but I, I know what you're saying is that, yes, but, you know, they were all part of the live set when we had to headline the show because Steve and then had to go back and find these extra songs to make the set an hour and a half long, you know, so that, that was all down to him. These All these songs were new to me. I just had to learn them as quick as I could, but the, the most important thing for me was working on the songs for the album and getting these harmony guitar parts uh, and, and dual guitar parts, even if they were unison, get these guitar parts set in the band, get the harmony vocal in, and without taking the sound away um, from that punky, exciting uh, sound, the raw sound, you didn't want to go too far because it would take the sound of Maiden away, you know. Oh, I, I agree. I, I It's funny, I, I say this to all my Maiden geeky fan you know friends fans that we've been around for so long i to me bruce is still the new guy you know just because the first two records are the ones that pulled me in yeah, and i liked that i liked the punky metal way more than the proggy metal i mean it's not i still love the band but i mean those first two records to me that's that's maiden it's also but it's also when i jumped in you know i jumped in right at that time um another geeky question were they starting i mean even on the kiss tour were, were they just starting to have problems with paul as well were you guys having problems with him or was that a little bit later on no that was before kiss that was before kiss uh, getting back to your first statement just there was yes um the reason why them first two albums sound similar was because them first two albums was the was the set that we had for an hour and a half apart from killers because we we wrote that, well, Steve wrote it while we were on tour. But most of them songs, because I remember saying to Steve, uh, how do you separate the songs for the first album? And he said, I'm not worried about the first album. I'm trying to work out what we're going to put on the second album. So the songs for the second album, most of them, Rothschild, we were already playing them live. So, um, which I can't remember at the moment, but I did a lot of work for Killers. Um <laughs> You are a popular man. Joes, I'm on an interview. I'm on an interview. Yeah, I'll ring you back. Sorry. That's okay. Oh, okay. Lucky he's recording. You can edit his out, you know. Exactly. Um, phones are going party. I don't know. I'm never here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so basically, um, he had to. He had the job. Him and, he was telling him and Rod would, would sit down and they would do all the all the uh, arranging for what songs went where. But the reason why an M2 album sound like the way they do is because they were the songs that we worked on live for the full show, and they added a couple uh, light killers at a later date. Um, getting back to your question about Paul um, on the Metal for Mothers tour. Um, now, this is 79. Um, he started 
um, becoming a bit of a pain. And, um, uh, he, he, you know, he would, one afternoon, he would just say, I'm pulling the gig tonight. Um, I've got a sore throat. And um, and I would say to Steve, you can't, you know, the kids have all paid their money. They've all got their tickets. It's sold out. We've got to do it. We'll do it without him. And Steve said, well, how can you do it without him? I said, well, we both know. The, the lyrics, so we'll do it, me and you will sing. I said, but I guarantee you one thing, is if we do this gig without him, he will never cancel another show because he'll know that we can do it without him. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Um, I don't know where it was, Midlands, up north and everything. And uh, um, he sat at the side of the stage and watched us, uh, but he never actually, he never pulled out another gig at all. And... Um, what worried me about Paul was um, his range, um, which was great for the punky stuff. Um, we had a long chat, Rod, myself and Steve, and I said, if you're thinking of going to America, um, you need to think about the lead vocal and the range because you're up against uh, your, your Dave Lee Roth, your Sammy Hagans, you're up against your David Coverdells, you're up against your Robert Plums. You know, Ronnie James Dio, you're up against these singers. But I just, the band's going to grow. You need the vocals to, to be, able, be able to have that range in their, in their pocket. Um, and so I don't know what happened after that because uh, when we got back from the Kiss tour, um, I was gone. And then uh, the next album, Paul did, and then he was gone. So, yeah, I don't know the reason why um, they got rid of him, but uh, I can guess you know, some of the things that happened. You know. so, so I have a non Iron Maiden question. Growing up where you did, who were your influences or who do you still love to this day that you listened to as a kid growing up? Well, my first influences was um, Lonnie Donegan uh, when I was about six years age. Um, then, of course, getting up to 11 or 12, teenager, uh, the Beatles and the Stones, um, just... You know, the vocal work and the call work and the songs were so interesting and so, so commercial and so catchy. Um, but starting to learn the guitar at 16, I was a big fan of Wishbone Ash because I used to go and see them live and, and I, I used to love the harmony guitar stuff that they did. It wasn't actually heavy metal, but um, I wasn't actually into heavy metal at that time. And so all the bands I worked with through the that my teenagers uh, years, 18, 19, 20, were harmony guitar bands. Um, and then slowly um, I could hear, you know, I got into American bands a long time ago with Journey and Toto and Foreign and things like that. But um, yeah, I think in the early days over here in the UK was Deep Purple. Um, I never actually got to see Led Zeppelin, but Black Sabbath and, and them sort of bands, you know, they were, they were they were sort of like bands that we looked up to, you know. Did, were um, you ever were you ever a fan of either Slade or Sweet? They yeah, in a way. Um, how can I say it? Well, there, no, you you go ahead, say it. Yeah, however you want. Yeah. Well, Slade Slade was a great rock band, a great rock band with a great singer. Um, Sweet were very clever because again. They dressed up in these, these costumes, uh, but they wrote interesting pop songs. Um, very catchy. They were always in the charts over here in the UK. But one thing I did find out was that uh, when you when you listen to the sweet songs, uh, the, the singles, a lot of people didn't know in them days uh, that they should listen to the B side because the B side of all the of all the sweet songs were actually heavy rock. And well, that's where it, Steve it, Harris got, got the idea from uh, that he wanted, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the guy that runs Sweet now. Uh, in, in, Andy, Andy Scott. Andy Scott. We went to see Andy about producing the first album because Steve loved the B-sides. He was even the point it out to me and said, you've got to hear the B-sides of these Sweet songs. And they were fantastic rock songs you know yeah so um as i say it was it was that was at, that was at the time you know you had bowie doing um the life on mars and things like that it was a, lots of stuff going on but 
But the early influences were the Beatles and the Stones. Well, and the reason I asked you that question, Dennis, is well, two reasons. One, Mark and I were talking about that just yesterday. He said exactly what you said about the B-sides. But I know as a kid living here in America that that those two bands were on the pop charts a lot, but yet yeah. neither one of them really ever broke in the U.S. And I was just kind of wondering what your impression of as to maybe why they didn't break here, yet they were very popular in the U.K. Well, you say that, yes, it was confusing over here in in the in the late 70s because you also had status quo now we were signed to the same management they never broke america mm -hmm. at the time but rory gallagher did yet over here and in europe status quo would sell out 60 80 000 arenas and rory gallagher was on, on the undercard but in America, because Rory was a bluesy guitarist, the Americans took to, to Rory more than they did Quo. They saw that 12 bar blues a bit repetitive, a bit boring. But um, uh, with, with Slade and Sweet, um, you're right. They, they just had, they even didn't sell out big shows over here. And they would never play at Wembley or in any, any of the big arenas. They hmm. would do the Alice with Odie and all the Rainbow. They were like a club band. So uh, it, it was very confusing for us over here where certain bands went to America. Like, who would have thought in 1980 that Def Leppard was going to go to America and be so huge? Right. You know, that's, like, that's like taking Cold and Newcastle over here, you know. Yeah. And it's interesting to me how it's so different in different countries, you know, because like my understanding, although I've never been to the UK, but plan to go next year, is that uh, there's still a lot of love for for metal and hard rock. And it seems like now in, in the States, we're just at that point where it, it, they're just shoving crap at people. And it's very hard for bands that are rock bands to get hurt. Well, it's the same. It's a similar sort of story here. Whereas in lockdown, um, I always there's not in this. You're lucky in America because you have all these radio stations. You have every every subject, every music uh, taste in radio stations. Over here, we have one uh, rock show, which is Planet Rock. Um, or you've got the BBC. We're, we're, we're governed by a lack of rock music. Um, especially in the in the charts and also on radio, but I, I, in lockdown I've been noticing, and it's not this doesn't come from being bitchy or um, jealous or sad. It's just one of them things that I know everyone's taste of music is different, um, so I'm not expecting everyone to sort of like the music I like, or I don't might not like their kind of music. But I did notice that on Planet Rock, if you listen to it in lockdown all day you're su i'm surprised at how much crap is on there and i don't know <laughs> i don't know how right. they do it i don't know how they get on a, a major radio station in this country and it, there are some fantastic bands on planet rock really good that we wouldn't have heard of uh unless they were on planet rock you know because you know the magazines are, are, are calming down now there's not many magazines the newspapers years ago with sounds, Melody Maker, if there is, are all finished. So, classic rock magazine, you know, I don't know, but there's, there's a lot of good bands on Planet Rock, but it gets to a point where after a little while, there's so much bad stuff on there that I just don't find it interesting. So, you know, it's, it's a personal opinion, you know. Right. I had, a, I had a question about Steve, to me, I hear a lot of, uh, Tall, a lot of early Jethro Tull and Steve songwriting. Was that a band that you enjoyed too? I, I used to like Jethro Tull. It was different, you know. Uh, Especially across. the time signatures. I mean, there's some yeah. incredible musicianship on that stuff. And well, I, did, I really I, picked yeah. that up with Maiden. I, I didn't know that when we, when we were first working with Maiden, when I first went in, um, I didn't know that Steve was a big fan of Jethro Tull and, um, until later. Because um, uh, it was when someone said to me, oh, before you joined the band, they did a Jeff Rotol cover. 
and uh, oh, no, did they? And he went, my mate went, yes, they did the So I rang Steve and said, did you ever record a cover from Jeffro Tull? And he said, yeah, but that's, that, you're right. It was all the different time changes, I think, that gave him that idea of, of doing that in heavy metal, you know. It might have been a good, a good, uh, a good thing for him to, to sort of like take forward into heavy metal, yeah. Yeah, because especially, I mean, Clive, Clive was such an incredible drummer. I mean, I, I, I'm a drummer as well, and he's somebody I always looked up to. I mean, that guy could flat out play. I mean, and this was before like the genres. I mean, that's another great thing about Iron Maiden, how influential you were, especially, you know, when you were in the band. I mean, those the, the time signatures, the changes, the drumming, it was very unlike, you know, what was going on. And that whole scene, the whole new wave of British heavy metal, you know, you had more traditional stuff like Saxon, but, you know, Maiden was really pushing the envelope again with the drumming and, the, you know, almost what would almost become blast beats now. The dun, 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 you know, I, especially on something like Phantom of the Opera. Holy crap. I mean, nobody was playing stuff like that. I mean, well, that was that was me. <laughs> that was me <laughs> on Phantom of the Opera. I didn't play yes. the drum, but what happened was that, um, when I realized that there was a drum kit there and they didn't have a drummer, uh, when I first joined the band in the rehearsal studio, um, I asked Steve and he went, no, we've, we've not got to get another drummer. So then I bumped into Clive uh, in a pub that we used to use uh, near where he's, he's, he lived. And um, I told him that I joined the band and I said to him, you know, do you want to come over and have a blow on the, on the kit, you know? And he said, yeah. So, but what I did was, um, I had a cassette of um, the, the demos from Phantom and um, uh, Prowler. On, on my over to the studio, I put it in the cassette player in the car. Uh, so Clive was lucky that he got an insight into what the songs were. And um, uh, so he had an idea of whatever. And when we got there, he played he played uh, Prowler and he played running free or a couple of other songs. But then when we come to Phantom, um, I was working on the guitars, the guitar riffs and things like that. And um, he was saying to me, you know, what, I don't see, I don't, I don't know how to get hold of this, the, the, the pace of this song is, you know, da -da 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 -da. and, you know, I'm not, I play drums, I like playing drums, but I'm not a drum. But, the thing was, as a guitarist sitting there going, da -da 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 -da, when it's not worth Clive just playing straight for. Da -da 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 -da. So I said, why don't you do? So I sat on the kit and I was going. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> oh, I love this. So he tried it, and it was completely different to what Steve was expecting. Um, and then, because when we all got together and Clive played that. It seemed to fit the snare hits was the, were fitting in with the, 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 the so it all worked really well and it made it, it made it totally different from playing playing just the, 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 the exactly the, the, you could yeah, not yeah. put a you could not put a John Bonham type beat behind that it doesn't work you know what I mean yeah exactly. you, you, you you need um, she's like almost like a Les Binks or um, I'm trying to, uh, the guy from Tall, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a lot more busy, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great, great exactly. stuff. That's cool. I did not know, again, that's, that's such a pleasure hearing, you know, someone who was there who helped, who helped write that. That's how come I love yeah, doing, yeah. you know, doing the show and, and talking to people like you. There was a lot of things that happened in the songs um, regarding the harmony guitars that they never had, like, um, we, you know, Iron Maiden and things like that, and the breakdowns. Um, uh, we, there was a lot of things that we added to the songs to make, as I said earlier, to make them more interesting. So um, I always thought, you know, like the <laughs> <laughs> and then the harmony cut in. It just it just makes it wider and bigger and more interesting uh, without taking that riff away from the band. You know? So, so you helped with those riffs, but you didn't get a song ready for it. No, because basically the song was already written. So mm. yeah, yeah, but still, those were major parts. I mean, yeah, I know, but no, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. It was um, all these songs were already, I think, already signed to Steve. So, yeah, 
I think it's Charlotte Harlot. I think Dave Dave Murray had a little bit to do with it. I think uh, what I can remember. But um, yeah, there was you know as I say, all them songs we put in. If we had to do a headlining set, these songs come out out of the out of the cupboard, out of the closet, and we had to rerun them because oh, we're not supporting, so we need an extra hour, an extra forty five minutes of song. So that's how it happened, you know. Den- Dennis, what was the what was the reason behind your departure from Maiden? Um, basically, because I've been on tour with RVB with Status Quo. Um, it's a long-winded story, but I, I need to tell you because it, it would clear up a lot of, a lot of um, problems. It's just it, it's just the fact that I like my own space and I like to to, to see a bit of, of the country that you're in or whatever. And I like mixing with people. The same as when we got out with Kiss, I was told, you know, don't don't bother them, don't 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 talk to them, leave them alone, and all that. But I got on really well with them. They took me out in Stockholm for my birthday. Uh, Paul Stanley and Jim Simmons took me out in Stockholm, so it was fantastic. But yeah, what basically when we was on tour with Quo, you got to remember the band I was with, RDB. We all grew up in the East End together, so we were mates before we were musicians. And then we become musicians, but we stuck together. So we were like a little group of mates that used to get. We made and it was a business. I joined a band that were the same mates, but they were mates because of the band. They didn't grow up together. They were mates because they were in Iron Maiden. Um, so it was more like a business. Um, while I was with, with RPB, I realised that after you've been on the road for a while, you can't. You can't stick together 24 hours a day because it causes arguments, people get tired, uh, irritable, no patience. And I found by moving away from the band every now and again helps. I'm also, I love joking about, I love having a laugh. So I like working with the crew. I like traveling with the road crew because they're characters. And you see more of the countryside when you're traveling with the crew. So basically, uh, I was explaining to Rob about the music I listened to, the Eagles, um, the Little River Band, and all the American bands I listened to. Um, Toto, but they're not heavy metal. Yeah, I know, but it's my taste of music. Um, I listen to it in my hotel room in private. If I listen to Motorhead 24 hours a day, how would I, how would I feel? So, yeah, that's that. And um, basically, we, we've been on the tour... Uh, we did the Judas Priest tour, got on really well with them, um, and then the Kiss tour. So, because it was a European tour, there's more driving during the day. And I used to sort of be in, we'd be in one place, and I'd go for a, a, a walk around in, in the south, south of Italy. I'd go down the beach and all that. Rob was one of these managers that loved to keep the whole band together 24 hours a day, you know, all five of us. Um, you know, and I was older than Rod, and I'd had more experience with touring, so I realised that you can get on people's nerves. And he didn't like it. And and basically, he was saying, well, you don't want to mix with the band. I said, of course I do. I said, but you also need your freedom, you need your space. So don't try and push everyone together all the time. And it was one thing, and he, then he got on the case about the music I listened to. So basically... He wasn't happy with a few things I was doing. The gigs were going really well. Um, I questioned him once and said, am I not doing my job properly? He said, you're doing your job absolutely brilliantly, better than what we did before. I said, okay, so there's no problems. But I then would go out and say, jump in the in the, in the, in the, in the truck with the road crew and go overnight or go with them during the day to the next gig. Um, it, then he'd come to the show, and I'd already be there with the crew, and he'd go absolutely potty that I wasn't in the bus with the band. And I went, well, just thought I'd make a change. Anyway, by the time the end of the Kiss tour um, came, uh, he was gunning for me anyway. So um, he, he made it quite clear that he, he said, I don't think you're, you're, um, you're into the band as much as you should be. You're not part of the band. You're trying to you're trying to isolate yourself from the band. And I, I said, look, you couldn't be further from the truth because if you keep people together 24 hours a day, they will they will fall out. And basically, I think after I went, I think that's exactly what happened. So I don't know. 
did did any of the other band members have these same issues with you or was it just management no i think uh, every now and again diana would would say something about you know oh he does his own thing and things like that but I, I, i'll tell you that because we're all adult but um you know it's it, it's it's like everything you know you're in you're in southern italy and it's like 80 or 90 degrees and we're, we're he wants you to wear a, like a, a jeans and a maiden t-shirt and i'm I said, well, I want to wear a pair of shorts and flip-flops and go and sit on the beach. So and we had a week there because we couldn't do the UK shows with kids. So we were like basically on a week's holiday. So you can't walk around with the, all the gear on if, if it's that hot. So it just got a little bit too much. And then um, when I got home, I think what happened was I was married at the time with a little girl. And um, I wanted to go home to see my wife and child and... Uh, he wanted us to go to his hotel and stay there and do this and do that. And I said, come on, just go home for the night and then come back the next day. We had a bit of an argument about it. So that made it even worse. So, yeah, so uh, it was short-lived. And um, so we said goodbye. Yeah. Now, now back to, the, back to the KISS tour. Do you have any specific memories of individual shows or things you stories that you remember that were fun or things that happened you know you, you mentioned gene and paul taking you out for your birthday but was there anything else on that tour where that were just road stories fun stories fun things that you remember yeah not not really like because um you know apart from watching their sound check and and uh Every now and again, you know, when Gene was, was flying from the top of one PA stack to the other, um, one of the guys on the on the hoist or something would have a little joke with him and he'd, 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 he'd swing him from one side of the PA to the other. And just as he was put about to put his foot down, he'd lift him up again and then they'd leave him right in middle air, in mid air above the stage because they were just having a laugh. But to be honest, because we never saw them until we got to the venue, because we were all together in our two of us. Um, and then we were put in our dressing room and we never actually saw them until they was going on stage or coming off stage because they were surrounded by security and the guys from the police force that worked in, in America, they had the bodyguards. So it was hard to sort of, you know, I was surprised that we actually went out on my birthday, but they did that. You know, Paul Stanley gave me a signed fire helmet from the whole band. Uh, for my birthday present, so it, it, it was hard, but there wasn't any. No, there wasn't. We didn't really mix with them. We didn't really see them. You know, it was. It's hard to say. And as I say, the shows were great. Um, it was. I don't know. It was just like wandering backstage, waiting for the doors to open. It, it, there wasn't much went on. You know. Did Did Kiss put any um, restrictions on Maiden? Did they limit sound, lights? Did they? Do you recall anything? No, I, I wouldn't know. Um, as I say, the only the only thing I heard was that they didn't want us to do the UK shows because our fan base was was quite big, and it would have been a a, a 50 50 uh, capacity in the show for Maiden and and um, for Kiss. So they wanted more Kiss fans there. But over there in Europe, I. I don't know. I, I don't think so. I would only say what the sound we had, because we had a great sound engineer. Uh, I, I just think everything was perfect for us. Out front, while we were on stage, if you could have maybe talked to a fan that was there at the time, they may have said, yeah, the PA was like not full strength. The lights were not full strength. But I, I wouldn't know, because I'm on stage, so I, I wouldn't know if they'd let us have a lot or not. I'm assuming you guys went on stage every night with the attitude is we're going to kick the ass and blow these old guys off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was not there with any band, you know, even with Quo in 76 when we was in Europe and RVB went out there and we, we, we do exactly the same as Quo, but, you know, you're not the headlining band. But the, as I said earlier, you know, the, the funny thing of the timing, the timing of that tour with Kiss was perfect for Maiden because they were coming up, the fan base was growing, growing, growing every day. And at the time I heard that Kiss were on a bit of a shaky 
ground at the time. I don't know the history, as I said earlier, but I think they were on a little bit of a shaky ground that made them thought, you know, this is going to, this tour is going to be good for us. And I think it was, you know, even with seeing all the t-shirts from the fans outside the venue. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're you're right. I mean, at that point in time, Kiss was definitely on shaky ground. I mean, they were they were starting to alienate, lose some of their hardcore diehard fans because their sound was softening, changing. And, you know, Iron Maiden was leading the way for the new generation of metal. I mean, Mark can talk about this. It's like at that point in time, you're a Kiss fan and there's Iron Maiden and there's Kiss Unmasked. You're embarrassed to play Kiss Unmasked because Iron Maiden blows it away. The thing is, also what you have to remember is the timing of that tour. Um, we didn't have we didn't have any more songs that were written. Just just that hour and a half worth of songs that we did for the Metal from Others tour, and the choice we had for the two albums. So doing that Kiss tour, as I say, the same as the Judas Priest tour, was perfect because Steve then could pick the strongest forty-five minute set that we got out of an hour and a half. So that, that set was well worth rehearsed because of the Judas Priest tour previous. So yes, it was, as you say, you could go out on stage feeling really confident because there were no new songs that we had to worry about. They were only the stuff we've been doing for the last six months. So it was, it was spot on, you know, the timing and the set. What are you, uh, what are you working on now, Dennis? Uh, the next line art album. When when are you, are you writing it? Do you have a timeline for it? Oh, that is already six songs that we've already put down as, as basic backing tracks. Um, basically, what happened was that after, well, as you know, in March last year when we went into lockdown, um, we finished the Reality of Miracles album. Um, that was all ready to go. Um, our manager, Holger, uh, in, in uh, Metal um, Flying Dolphin from uh, Metal Bill Records, our manager said we're, we're, we're struggling because of the COVID. Um, we were ready to, to, to release the album, and he thought it might be a good idea because it was all finished. We're lucky to have Steve Mann, who works with Mike Wyshenka. Um, he, he, he's also at Lionheart from 1980. Uh, he's got a fantastic studio in Germany and he's a great engineer producer and he masters everything. He records everything. So we're lucky in a way to have that studio in Germany where um, it got to about June, March, April, May last year, where our manager said, listen, all the big guns are holding back releasing their album. We're going to take a chance. We release Reality of Miracles. Uh, in the end of July, and they did it, and uh, the album done really well. Uh, it was it was well received. We had fantastic reviews, uh, especially from over in America, because the the, the second nature, the album before, uh, never actually got released in America because we were with a different record label that only released it in in Europe. Um, our, our record company in Japan, King Records, they did a fantastic job in Japan for second nature but with the, the reality of miracles um with flying dolphin we were able to um able to release it all over and uh, we got great reports uh reviews were fantastic um and you know some of the some of the charts was like number one in the aor charts whatever so it was just a shame that we again we weren't allowed to promote that album by touring so, as you know, so from March right the way through to Christmas, uh, we're basically in and out of lockdown. Um, it got to Christmas, this, this last Christmas, and um, we had a chat with Holger, and he said the same thing as everyone else is saying. Um, we don't know what the future holds with the record industry and the music industry, venues, promoters. We don't know. We still won't know until around about September, October this year, after the summer. So the idea was we had a meeting with we had a Zoom meeting like this with Holger two weeks ago, and uh, 
he told us that by October, October, November, he will have a bigger picture of how the world's going to pan out regarding records, venues, promotion, touring. He'll have a better picture. So the good thing about that is that now it's coming to the end of July, we've already got five or six songs uh, written and laid down, ready for vocals, ready for lyrics, ready for lead to put the lyrics to them, ready for the choruses, the harmonies, ready for the guitars. So we're lucky to be ahead of schedule. And basically by, I'd say, August, uh, we should have a good 12, 13 songs ready for the album. Um, and then in October, we'll find out when when Holger decides he wants to release the album. But there's, there's, no, there's no excuse for not being able to tour with an album. You need that tour in to promote the band. So at exactly. the moment, we're all sitting here, you know, frustrated, as you know, and with our hands tied. So we're, we're lucky enough to be able to still record from all our home addresses and here in, in Fairy Cross Studios. And then we just send everything over to Steve and he puts the, chip, the jigsaw puzzle together. So it's a great setup that we've got. We just hands are tied at the moment. Yep. But, Yep. Where where can um, fans and listeners find you and Lionheart on the internet? Where can they follow you and get more information? Uh, well, you've got me there because Steve and Rocky are the brains behind this, this band, and they're the clever ones, um, with Christian, who does all their graphics. Um, now, they set up a new Lionheart music, um, which at the moment... I can't remember what it is because they changed it. Let me do and a quick so, search right here and yeah, see what I can find. Yeah, but you'll find that American Lionheart, the punk that nicked our name. Yeah. Um, well, that's not cool. <laughs> uh, Lionheart, UK band. Let's see if there's a website link on here. External links. Well... They only have steveman.net listed on here. Yeah. I know there it, there is there is uh stuff out there but I I can't I can I can I can basically email it to you um after because they will probably tell me off for not knowing. Yeah. <laughs> there is um uh on Facebook I think this is you maybe it's not yeah, no i think man. this is i think this is the punk rock band that told you nick, nick your know. name <laughs> that's not cool at all um you guys just follow go go search for Lionheart on the internet you'll find you'll find them through i so can find out i can make a phone call yeah, no, we'll 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 get the information out. I want I want everybody to be able to follow you and 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 stay up to date with what you're doing with Lionheart. Um, Dennis, this was like I said up front, a real honor. I yeah, mean, totally. You know, interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an honor for me because, as I said, this this last 15, 16 months, I never thought I could ever get depressed in my life. But it's been bloody hard, you know, and. Yeah. And now, and as we get older, these these have been losing the best years. Now, know. you know, it's frightening. You know, we're, we're losing so much time to promote things. You know. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. But you know, thank you so much for sharing your maiden stories and stories uh, touring pleasure. with Kiss. And uh, again, this was a real honor. What do you got there, Mark? It's a picture of him playing. Off there you the go. First record. So. There you go. There you go. Um, so once again, Dennis, thank you so much. Uh, we ask everybody who's listening and watching, follow Dennis, stay up to date with the Lionheart. Yeah. Support, support, support. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mark, you're the fanboy. You're the Iron Maiden geek. Was that a geek fest for you? It was. He's pouring his drink here. I'm from Detroit. You got three burners, you know? Um, yeah, I love the stories. I love the stories that he was telling, especially. Look, about I'm, I'm telling you, you know how many fucking geeks like me are going to go, you came up with the drum part? 
and that really funky part of um, Phantom of the Opera. That drum part's motherfucker. And the fact that he's like, oh, you know, don't play a beat there. Play this crazy far. I'm like, I never heard that story. And I've read every fucking, you know, maiden book, you know, out there. It was funny because there's a lot of things I didn't ask because he was explaining them without me having to explain them, especially when he left. I was, I was kind of, I felt bad for the guy because again, just reading all the maiden bios, anybody, they literally were pissed that he liked like, you know, soft American rock. I know I was re- I was reading online. It's like, basically the reason I got fired is because I like the Eagles. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. like, and i'm just okay. i'm like this is the same guy who came up with that killer fucking part in and in, in phantom of the who cares he listens who cares it, it, it doesn't it, like the eagles it almost i don't know as he was explaining what happened there it almost feels like that was just an excuse that they they came up with that yeah you know that management just had to come up with all these excuses to get rid of them that maybe there was some other reason oh we don't like your the music you listen to oh we don't like the fact that you hang out with the the crew you're not spending 24 hours with I, all, all that stuff i've stuff. read all that stuff though i've i've read that you know in maiden book martin popoff's written a couple maiden books and they you know those stories from all in 10 purposes look like 100 percent accurate and i'm like how the fuck do you does he show up on time? Does he play good? Is, is he, he doing his knowing? job? Is he making the music better? It, yes, yes, exactly yes. I mean. Get rid of him. <laughs> I know. That's what made it seem so odd. I'm like, well, he wasn't a dick. He wasn't doing what, uh, you know, what Diano did. Yeah, well, I'm exactly. not going to put, you know. I'm yeah. like, this is a team player. Why are you getting rid, rid of this guy? Well, whatever, you know. But, yeah, I mean, put it this way. And all the main bios and shit that I've read, I've never read anyone go, Oh yeah, he was that, but he was also a drunk, or is also, you know what I mean, fucking yeah. Steve's wife or something. Yeah. None of it was like, no, everything, everything they said, you're like, well, why the fuck did you get rid of him? Don't be wrong, I mean, Adrian Smith's great, but I'm like, if I was him, I would. How could you not though? And he, it's funny how he never even brought it up, and I'm like, especially made a band that's arguably the biggest band in the world or one of the biggest bands in the world. When I say that guys, remember, don't look at it with your American or North American blinders. Your, on. your kiss blinders. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, Maiden plays around the world and pretty much anywhere they want to play. Yep. Un- unlike a lot of other artists. I'd say and they're bigger than you too. I would make that same argument. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, there, there's no question of Maiden's influence. And it, it was just great hearing his stories of those very early formative years of Maiden. And, you know, it, you know, and I appreciate his honesty regarding Kiss as well. It's like, no, I wasn't a fan. I didn't. Nothing, I was there's nothing that. wrong with that. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. I was wondering if he was, you know, if they were on his radar at all, just because of the, you know, that UK tour they did before Destroyer came out in the United States, or I should say before someone slays me. Yes, Destroyer came out in March of 76. The tour they did in Europe in, uh, you know, um, in in the spring uh, of 76. Um, Yeah, I mean, they were getting a lot of press and sounds. I mean, I've got all those clips. Um, uh, Kiss you know they were they were pretty big news over there then and the fact that but like he said he was working on his own thing and he was focused on his own world and his own yeah new, yeah nothing yeah. wrong with that no not not at all um yeah i i again i just i love i love the stories you know he was there he lived it he was part of something that was extremely influential and will stand the test of time and to hear from somebody who was actually there um, yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. Real quick, do you guys who opened for Kiss in in uh, in England? I don't know. And that, it was a girl. Was it? Oh. Yes. And that uh, with the future Def Leppard. Uh, yeah. Um, guitar player Phil Collins. Yep. And well, future also, lead singer for LA Guns. Exact. All right. What Kiss? What Kiss cover did they do? Do you love me? That's right. And they got thrown off the tour. 
I will tell you um, uh, that Hollywood. What the hell's the what's what's the first? It's their first record, I think, with Hollywood T's on it. What's that record? Called? I can't fucking. St- that album's awesome. You should go get it. Um, that 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 uh, first first two girl records. Yeah, I think still, yeah. Uh, the, the first one's fantastic. Absolutely fucking um, love that. Go check it out. Matter of fact, right now, stop this. Um, go to YouTube, watch Hollywood Tees if you're not familiar with them, and then come back and go, wow, that's a great fucking song. So there you go. Um, what kind of homework do we have for this week? Obviously, it's got to be, I, I, I would say, couple. Were you able to see Maiden open for Kiss when they yeah. toured Europe? What did you think? Um, did Maiden blow them away? Was it kind of a crazy contrast? Because that's what I was trying to dig into was, you know, that was an interesting contrast of headliner and opening band. You know? well, it, you was too with, too. it was with Judas Priest as well on the Dynasty Tour. Really? Yeah, but you, but you got to remember, though, too, especially in Europe, and sorry for our European fans, it was the truth. Um, culturally, musically, in some ways, they were a year or two behind. I mean, Kiss was still the hard rock monster perceived when they got there you know that's why kiss took their another reason why they took their show on the road they right. didn't tour the states right. so they they went to the market and incidentally that's what happened As a matter of fact i always loved uh, what uh, mr lent loving learning to love the third world remember they didn't have any more other options yep you know when kiss went there on the creatures tour you know the american tour just went belly up they couldn't afford to go to fucking europe but I mean, so, Mark, Mark, could you could you visualize being a kid back then and going to kiss an Iron Maiden and Iron Maiden basically plays that 45 minute set. It's the first album. And then Kiss comes on and plays tracks off of Unmasked. I mean, talk about contrast. Talk about I mean, just the the aggressiveness and the energy of those different sets. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Although, um, you know, when you go see bands, you kind of, you know, you're kind of getting the frame of mind of whatever, whoever you're, you know, you're watching, I think. Um, whereas, yeah, I would have totally dug the the Maiden set. But then, you know, it was party time. It would have been party time when Kiss came out. You know what I mean? Sure. I'm going to see the, the big stadium show. And, and, and quite frankly, you know, that's why I, I've said on this show many times, that's why I like making sure I'm always there for the opening band. You know, I, you never know what you're going to find. And, you know, uh, put it this way, if you were strictly a Kiss fan and you went to go see this new band called Iron Maiden, hopefully you would have been blown away and went, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy that T-shirt. I'm going to fly that flag. You know what I mean? Yep. Because, again, I've done that uh, numerous times, you know, with, with – uh, um, some people who are guests on the show. I mean, that's how I really got into New England. I, although, to be fair, I already had the record because they were playing um, Don't Ever Want to Lose Ya on the radio here. And there was also that promotion. I think we talked about that then, but do you guys remember the promotion when, you know, is, is New England Kiss Without Makeup? Do you guys remember that? I don't remember the promotion, but I, I remember the rumors going around that were like oh yeah you know new england is is kiss without makeup yeah but that i mean it was literally at our record i think it was a record stop or one of one of the record stores here in the detroit area that was literally a little poster uh, on the wall but 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 that's my point though i i remember being totally blown away when i saw new england i'm like wow this is even better than the record you know what I mean? Um, so that's what I mean. You, you go there and let's be honest, too. New England didn't sound like Kiss. They were more. And if you wanted to put the sound on them, it was more of a journey esque sort of AOR. Um, but but, you know, keep in mind when when New England was opening on the Dynasty Tour, we were already at the beginning of the, quote, softening of the Kiss sound. Yeah, that's fair. It would, um, you know, you know it, w- it would have been different. Could you imagine New England opening the Creatures of the Night tour? Mm. Yes, would have been different. Yeah, would have been absolutely. different. It was a better. It was a better fit on the Dynasty tour. Well, especially sure. the show that I got to see. I mean, because cheap. It was 
my show was New England, Cheap Trick, and Kiss. I mean, and and Cheap Trick, um, Dream, Dream Police wasn't out yet. Uh, they were still touring. Dream Police was done, but it hadn't been released. Right. They were still and promoting like said, Budokan. Correct. Still promoting Budokan. And they did play I Know What I Want, I Know uh, How to Get It um, on uh, when they played here. And uh, I remember... When I found when, when Dream Police finally came out a few months later, I was like, so I'm like, this is the song they played. You're like, sure, kid. You know, I like, know oh, that song. I yeah. got to hear it. Like, and it's funny because they pretty much play it to this day. <laughs> I love that song too. I bet for, for the non cheap trick fans, I, I get a kick out of that just because it's like the only song Robin doesn't sing. And I love that song. So it's uh it's pretty cool. But, but yeah, I mean home, homework wise, were you able to see Maiden open for Kiss in Europe? Um what do you what do you think of uh, the debut Maiden album? Um have you checked out Lionheart? I got yeah, admit, and, I, yeah I, exactly. And yeah. have you checked out Lionheart? And if not, then go. Go check it out. Support Dennis. Um all right. I think there's nothing else we need to wrap up before we say goodbye Kiss so tour starts in a couple of weeks kids fingers crossed let's say you know as mark you and i talked about last week fingers crossed that kiss doesn't run into the road bumps that buck cherry and foo fighters and brett michaels have run into well, although not a fan it looks like the uh um the green day tours off to uh, green day and i think didn't paul i thought i saw a photo paul stanley went to the first show in dallas I don't know about that, but I know that Green Day played rock and roll all night. I thought I saw a photo, and I don't know, maybe I saw somebody else's photo. I thought I saw a photo that Paul was at the show. I don't know. I don't know. That part I cannot confirm, but what I can confirm is that they've played rock and roll all night at least twice now because they did like a club show. Mm -hmm. I, again, I just saw this by just paying attention to stuff, music news. Um, again, you know, it's funny. I saw Green Day. <laughs> it was funny because it's almost like a fuddy-duddy story. My best friend, um, his years ago, God, this had to have been. When did Green Day come out? Oh, Ninety-eight. Yeah, was it that? It, it, it's been. I think Dookie came out. Yeah, I mean, it was a long time ago. Dookie always comes out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but when whenever they hit big. <laughs> Can we be my, done, my, please. I got other my, things to do. <laughs> my, my, you're going. Come on, that's funny. My my buddy asked me to take his son because he wasn't a fan of going to a rock concert. So I took his kid, and I remember, you know, because he calls me Uncle Mark. He's like, Uncle Mark, what do you what do you think? And I'm like, check out a band called the Ramones because <laughs> that's pretty much what it reminds. Leave me it of. to Mark to burst the kid's bubble. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, I mean that in a good way. <laughs> No, I look. I know, I, I know, I know. I think Green Day's good. I don't, I don't, I, but it's not for me. You know what I mean? Um, it's okay. But like I said, when I, when I, I, that was their first tour, or at least put it this way, that was when they were able to play bigger places. It was the first time they ever played Kobo. So whenever that was, maybe it was late 90s, early 2000s, but I went to that show. I took him. And uh, like I said, I thought it was just a modernizing of the Ramones. And it was good. I, I got to admit, I enjoyed it. I liked them. So. Well, uh, before we say goodbye, if you are watching or listening on YouTube, please subscribe, follow us on Spotify, subscribe on iTunes. Um, that's it. You know what your homework questions are and you know where to go to leave your answers. We'll see everybody next week. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.